Um, and similarly, we have many, many examples of of, um, of, of arhats and 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 of other of other Theravada masters teaching uh, teaching people. It, it almost seems as as though it is a is it an automatic reflex in a certain sense that when one achieves egolessness, um, then uh, not wanting any longer anything for oneself, uh, one auto- almost automatically um, um, uh, turns one's attention to the needs of, of other of other living beings, and this this appears again and again in the biographies of various Theravada masters. I've recently been in Thailand. I've been looking at the stories of some of the masters from the uh, forest tradition uh, in Thailand. And all of them, uh, as soon as they achieve a degree of, of, uh, of understanding, a degree of enlightenment, uh, of freedom, immediately they turn their attention to teaching others. We don't, we, I, I, have, I haven't found any any record of anyone who simply disappears uh, into the forest. Now, of course, that may be because those who simply disappear into the forest don't leave any records. But the fact is that there seems to be a very common response to turn to others uh, once one has no longer any desires for oneself. So in this sense, I would, I would almost suggest, I would guess that... Um, not always, but in many cases, just as the development of compassion uh, leads to the, to the development of wisdom, so the development of wisdom in its own turn leads to the development of compassion. So in a sense, if you develop wisdom, if you understand not self, egolessness, if you have no more wishes for yourself, no more desires for yourself, then not always, but in many, many cases, um, you begin to think about others and how you can benefit others. So, in a certain sense, I think, one, compassion, compassion inevitably leads to the development of wisdom. Wisdom often leads to the development of, of compassion. I think, in, in some sense, these are reciprocal. It's difficult to have one without at least a good measure of the other. Uh, yes, Doctor. Uh, we, for this center here, we do the offering of Tarapuja once a week, and then we also do the Chenerji practice once a week. So, uh, do you think once a week is enough? Well, um, I, this, this sort of question, I, I can only answer by saying it's it, it, it's better than none. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's better than not at all. It, it may not. Uh, well, I mean, what is enough? You know, I mean, every day is every day enough. Is is three times a day enough? Um, in a certain sense, it's never enough. Or 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 you 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 know you it isn't enough until your whole life is is. Uh, is part of the pure vision but then again we need to also um, we need to also uh, take account of and, and allow for the limitations that are part and parcel of the real world and uh, uh, most of you have to work most of you have families to look after you have a lot of, of, of responsibilities and you know it, it may not be possible um, Particularly to um, to to gather together uh, at the temple more than uh, once a week uh, for for each of these practices. Of course, it would be better to do it more often. Um, you can always do it at home. Um, you know, it, it it it's not it's not possible really for me to give a categorical answer to this. I think under the circumstances, doing these each once a week is 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 quite is quite good. Uh, I know of centers in in America, for example, where people only get together once a month. Uh, 